Let's show our appreciation for the choir and orchestra. Wow. Not ashamed. I like that. I like that. Well, good morning, everyone. I am so delighted to see you on this Pentecost Sunday. As some, so many of you are asking, the, the red is for the fire that came down uh, from heaven on that day, and this ushers in a new season of the church. Before my feet hit the floor this morning, I, I had David's 26th Psalm on my mind. For in verse 8 of the 26th Psalm, it says, I love the house where you live, O Lord, the place where your glory dwells. Isn't that beautiful? The house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. David understood that the sanctuary, or in his day, the temple or the tabernacle, is that holy place where God reveals his glory. And just like David, we are here because we are in pursuit of it, in search of the glory and the holiness we receive when we come into God's house. And so I welcome you to the place, to the sanctuary where God's glory dwells. And to everyone here and those of you who are watching online, I greet you all in the name of God our Father, Christ our risen Savior, and in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, our comforter, counselor, and guide. I'm so pleased that you've chosen this hour to worship with us here at the Woodlands Methodist Church. And I thank you for the privilege of your time. For the last few weeks, our current sermon series, A Grace-Filled Life, has attempted to delve into the boundless and immeasurable understanding of God's grace. It is estimated that the word grace or some form of it is used over 150 times in the New Testament alone. Grace, again, is the favor of God that is freely given to us, unconditionally and without merit. Notice I said freely given, but in my heart of hearts, I do believe that God is open to some negotiation that would bring you closer to him for this free and unrestricted gift. One writer has said that if God is love, then grace is God's love that stoops, that bends, that lowers itself to meet us in our time of need or when we least expect it. In other words, for me, grace is love come down. And it is with that explanation that brings me to the most extraordinary and amazing act of grace recorded anywhere in the scriptures, the day of Pentecost the day of Pentecost. It is fitting that we end this sermon series on this day talking about grace because indeed for me it was grace come down in the form of the Holy Spirit. Found in the book of Acts chapter 2, the writer of this sacred manuscript, who is Luke, records in great detail what took place on that day when love came down in the form of the Holy Spirit and gave birth? This is the birthday of the church. Luke's writing is so precise that we know exactly when it happened. It happened 50 days after the resurrection, after Easter. For the Greek word, Pentecoste, means 50, 50. It was in association with another 
Jewish festival, Savot, and it coincided with the events of this day. And so 50 days after Easter came Pentecost. And we even know the time of day that it happened, that this incident took place. Nine o'clock in the morning is when it happened. So, in a very real way, in a very truthful way, the details of Acts 2 actually put us at the scene, and I like to call this the scene of this conspiracy of grace. That's what I call it. And if we allow ourselves to get caught up in the spirit of Pentecost, we too can experience the wonder and the amazement of revival, of change, of transformation, of empowerment that literally changed the world. Walk with me just for a few minutes as we look at what is often called by Seedbed, the publishing company, the grace of Pentecost. That's the title that they give it. A day when God's power was displayed in such a way that even to this day it is difficult to explain or let alone understand. And the only explanation that I have found through all these years of my ministry and trying to explain Pentecost, a way that pays homage to, to what took place in Jerusalem on that day, is this. It was the day that God rolled up his sleeves and went to work. And what mighty sleeves they were. Let us pray. Spirit, of the living God fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God fall afresh on me. Amen. It was the famous English poet Geoffrey Chaucer who was also the author of Canterbury Tales. You know, you can't get out of high school without knowing about Canterbury Tales. It was Geoffrey Chaucer, the author, who is given credit for this timeless proverb all good things must come to an end. He was the one who wrote that. We've all used that phrase before, for it's a wise reminder of how temporary, how transitory good things, pleasant things are. They come and they go. However, I've discovered that when it comes to understanding the nature of God, Good things never come to an end. That's who God is. Good things never come to an end. Such is the case as we find ourselves on the very first page of the book of Acts this morning. The ministry of Jesus has come to an end. Following his resurrection, that, that chapter in Acts 1 says, Jesus remained with his disciples 40 days. 40 days after his resurrection, and then it was time for him to ascend to his father. Seemingly, God's great experiment of salvation had run its course, and all the wonderful things that Jesus did in his brief three-year ministry were over. The good had come to an end which is exactly what the disciples thought. But God had something else in mind. 
I've got this sermon I got to preach to you one day. It says, our ending is God's beginning. And that's what happened. His disciples were perplexed, bewildered, and deeply distressed when they discovered that he was about to go back to be with his father. So much so that when they were together for the very last time, they asked him, Master, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? Is this the time? They were, they were just so confused. But Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has fixed by his own authority. And before Jesus was taken back up into heaven, in the sky, he gave them this charge. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the gift my Father has promised. Gift? What is he talking about? Wait? Oh, we can't do that. We're not good at waiting. I'm so glad that we weren't there when Jesus gave that order. Because we, when we are given instructions to wait, waiting is not one of our best virtues. Let's just say it like that. As a matter of fact, it's not on the top 10, the top 20, the top 30 of our greatest assets. Waiting is just not there. Years ago, I remember a, a little poem that I would read to my children from Dr. Seuss, and it was titled, The Waiting Place. The Waiting Place. It was a wonderful little poem, a testimony, not just for children, because that little poem has stayed with me all my life. It's a wonderful little testimony to how we spend so much of our lives just waiting. Life is full of waiting places. But for us, that presents a problem. That poses a problem when you say waiting. We are the generation of instant everything. Everything. When, you, when you're going up and down the aisle of your friendly HEB supermarket, you'd, you'd be surprised how many people I see in HEB. Do you live here? Yes, I do. Uh, anyway, when you're going up and down the aisle of HEB, just notice one day how many products have the word instant associated with it. <laughs> instant mashed potatoes that taste like cardboard. <laughs> instant pudding that doesn't hold any. Instant everything. We are a people of instant everything. We are without a doubt the most impatient society that ever lived. In fact, waiting is the most irritating experience most of us can go through. But I know one place where it's the only place that will try your patience. And let me, let me just do a disclaimer here. Doctors, I'm not after you, but have you been to your doctor's office lately? I understand, doctors. We have doctors in the room. I understand what you're up against. They, they don't understand, but I understand. <laughs> have you been to your doctor's office lately? Most of you know what I'm talking about. When you finally get there, don't you love the waiting rooms <laughs> where you have those year-old magazines <laughs> and you're trying to work your way through and trying to find something that's, that's a little bit more current than 2022 or whatever. You, don't you just love the waiting room? And then there's the TV that's on the wall set on a channel that you would never look at when you were at home. <laughs> the last time I was in my doctor's office, it was on the QVC channel. I don't buy anything from QVC. And, and, and what I found out was is that they hide the remote, all right? <laughs> it's done away. You couldn't change it if you wanted to. It was so painful that I think I had to go outside in the, in the lobby there just to wait until I was called. But have you heard the story of the man who 
went to his doctor's office, and he waited for an hour before being called into the examination room, over an hour. And then when he got in the examination room, he, 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 the door closed and he waited for another 30 minutes. Do you know you can lose your mind in an examination room with the door closed, conjuring up all kinds of things? What, what, what is he going to say? What am I? 30 more minutes passed with the door closed. Finally, the doctor's assistant walked in. And not the doctor, but the assistant walked in. And as she was looking at his chart to verify the information and while looking over his date of birth and everything, she looked up and, and said, how old are you, sir? And in frustration, he answered, do you want to know how old I was when I got here or how old I am now? <laughs> that's, that's the way it goes. It will try your patience. But the lesson that I want to share with you is this. Quite often, there will come those times in our lives when we have no control over waiting over anything. And all we can do is wait. And then there are those times when we need to acknowledge that God often sends us to the waiting place, his waiting room, where we know that the outcome is totally in God's hands. And all we can do is wait patiently for God to work things out. I share that with you because some of you are in God's waiting room right now. Right now. You're waiting to know the results of the test. You're waiting for the doctor's diagnosis. You're waiting. And that becomes a, a difficult thing to do. And I, I know that. I've been there. But when I read this story in the book of Acts, when Jesus said, go back to Jerusalem, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait. It was amazing how I rediscovered how they spent their time waiting. You want to know how they spent their time? Acts 1.14 tells us exactly. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They prayed. They prayed constantly. And, and Jesus stayed 40 days, told them to go back to Jerusalem, and for 10 days they stayed together praying. And it was in those 10 days that they prayerfully elected the, the disciple who would take Judas' place, Matthias. It, it was they were all together in prayer. That's how they spent their time together in prayer. And so after 10 days of waiting and praying, the 50th day came. And the scriptures tell us that they were all gathered in one place. I'm, I'm reading directly from scripture because this, this story is one that you can't add anything to it nor can you take anything away from it. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And the scripture said, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. When God-fearing Jews from every nation heard the sound, a crowd gathered together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what, what does this mean? While others made fun of them, saying, they have had too much wine. Yes, the Bible is humorous. They had too much. But <laughs> the promise that Jesus 
spoke of, the gift that he talked about had arrived on that day. The disciples went from being mere disciples to being apostles. Why? Because of the overpowering gift of grace poured out upon everyone in the form of the Holy Spirit. It empowered them to do the unthinkable, the unimaginable, the unattainable. Peter stood up. He stood to it. This is the same Peter that denied him. The same Peter who was always clueless as to what Jesus was going to do. Peter stood up on his feet and he addressed the crowd. And he said, these men are not drunk as you suppose because it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, what you're witnessing is spoken of by Joel when he said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your, old, your young men will see vision and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. The scripture goes on to say that when people heard this, they were cut to the heart. I like that line. I went and looked it up. Cut to the heart means that it was in that very moment that they realized it was their sin that put Jesus on the cross. And so the guilt, the shame, all of that cut to the heart. And they cried out to Peter, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh, my brothers and sisters, this is the day that it all came together for Peter and the other apostles and for the 3,000 people, it tells us how many people joined church that day. For the 3,000 who accepted Peter's message and were baptized, they were added to the number, thus the beginning of the church. It was their aha moment when it all made sense. When what Jesus was about and what he was trying to tell them all made sense when they understood for the first time that God's goodness didn't come to an end when Jesus went back up to heaven. No, it multiplied when the Holy Spirit was made available to them through the loving kindness of God's grace. That's what happened on this day. But what does it all mean for us? What is the message contained in this remarkable story of empowering grace given to us by God? Well, let me give you my takeaway on it. First thing, you need to know that God has a gift for you. You know, when we do our announcement for first-time visitors, we say, we, get, we got a little gift for you down the hallway. Well, God has a gift for you right now, right here. That's the, what you need to know is, is that this promised gift that God has for us, which Jesus talked about, excludes no one and includes everybody. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about transformative grace. That, that's the grace that comes right upon us. But everybody is eligible for empowering grace. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit the totality of God's grace, and it's available to all who would receive it. The passage I just read says not only will God pour out his grace on sons and daughters, but even upon his servants. Everybody has equal access to the grace found in the Holy Spirit. But secondly, let me go through this. Even though we all have equal access to the Holy Spirit, there is an equal demand. No, there isn't. You see, 
You have to invite the Holy Spirit and be willing to accept God's favor to be used by you and for the benefit of others. You have to ask for it. The Holy Spirit will not go where it is not invited. That's what you need to understand. When those disciples got together and prayed, they were literally asking, summoning, requesting a power that was beyond their capacity or their capabilities. And the same is true with the church of today. If we don't invite the Holy Spirit into our gathering to lead us, to guide us, then we will drift like a boat without a rudder or a ship without a sail. That's the reason I stand here every, every Sunday when I preach and say I greet you in the name of God our Father, Christ our risen Savior, and in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit because I never want to be accused of not inviting God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit to be a part of our worship. They are essential. I've been around the church all my life grew up in a parsonage. I've learned a lot about church. And one thing that I've discovered is this. When people walk through the door of the church, how long do you think it takes them to find out or to realize if the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, or Jesus' presence is in this place? Think about that. How long do you think? Let me tell you, 30 seconds to a minute. That's how long it takes for some to re someone to realize if the Spirit is in this place. And that's a fact. <laughs> Mrs. Wilson's fourth grade class, Sunday school class, was given the charge to teach her class the Apostles' Creed that we all say. Each student was going, was going to be given a line of the Apostles' Creed and each one was going to say their line until the very end. And so the Sunday came when Mrs. Wilson's fourth grade class came before the church. All the parents were there. Grandparents were there. They had their little cameras, and they wanted to see their little children recite the Lord's, I mean, the Apostles' Creed, the affirmation of faith. And so they stood in line. And so the first young lady said, I believe in God the Father. And then the, the second young man said, maker of heaven and earth. And then the third one said, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And then when they got to the next person who was supposed to say, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, there went silence. <laughs> Nobody knew what was happening except the young lady who was supposed to come next. And she turned around and said, Mrs. Wilson, the Holy Spirit is absent this morning. <laughs> He's not here. He is sick. And so they had to go on. In a lot of churches, the Holy Spirit is absent because we cling to the wrong things. We cling to the things of God, and God has given us the Spirit that excludes no one, but includes us all. Let, let me end by saying John Hyde, H-Y-D-E, was the son of a Presbyterian minister. He left England in 1892 to go to India to serve as a missionary in the Punjab region. And while he was on his way to India, he received this distressing telegram. It read, John Hyde, are you filled with the Spirit of God? It made him angry. And Hyde crumbled the telegram and put it in his pocket. The audacity of somebody to ask me that question, Hyde said to himself, here I am, a missionary, sincere, dedicated, leaving my home, going to another country, and someone has the nerve to ask me, am I filled with the Holy Spirit? 
But Hyde's anger soon turned to conviction because in his first years there, he struggled to learn the language. He lost most of his hearing. His mission gained only a few converts, and he also endured persecution. And in his journal, he writes one day that he went to God to find the reason why he had failed. And getting down on his knees, he cried out to God, Oh God, the audacity of me to think that I could pray or preach or witness or live or serve or do anything in my own strength and in my own power. Lord, fill me with your spirit that I might have power to serve. It was that prayer that turned the ministry of John Hyde around. And he became one of the greatest missionary statesmen of all times because he realized that his greatest need was the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And that becomes our greatest need this morning. Because you see, any time that we think that we can go through this thing called life on our own, on our, in our own strength, you are doomed to fail. And it will be only when you fall down on your knees and say to God, fill me with your spirit so that I might have the power to serve. When you do that, when you do that, you will know, you will invite the spirit into your life and your life will never be the same. Did you know that Texas has more than $8 billion in unclaimed property that dates back to 1980, $8 billion. And in this year alone, $340 million have been returned because they cannot find the rightful owner. God's grace is freely given. And best of all, God knows who the rightful owner is. It's you. It's you and you and me. And the next time that something good happens to you, something unexplainable happens to you, and you don't know from whence it comes, just know that it's God's spirit that is work at work around you and for you and with you. And if you just invite it into your life as they did on that Pentecost Sunday, all good things will never, never come to an end. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.